So we're going to pick it up there in 2 Samuel chapter 3. We did the first uh, 22 verses last week, but uh, we're just going to pick up the story there at uh, verse 22, where it says, And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop, and Joab came from pursuing a troop, and, excuse me, and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he was sent him away and was gone in peace. And so really this passage here, uh, you know, we, this is where we learn a lot about this character, Joab. You know, and Joab's a very significant character um, in the Old Testament. You know, he's, he, he isn't quite yet, we're going to see here tonight, that he, in, in, a, in just a few chapters, how he becomes the captain. And it's actually kind of telling of, of, of Joab's character. And I do want to take a minute to look at him because Joab in the Bible, though he's, you know, serving King David, though he's on the right side, I don't think he's a good guy. I think he's, he's uh, in fact, I would say he's a, he's a megalomaniac, in fact. He's, he's a guy who desires power, and we're going to see some things about Abner that we can learn uh, what not to do. And I want to preach tonight about the bad example of Joab, the bad example of Joab. Now, a few things about Joab is the fact that he is David's nephew. You, know, you might have caught that there where it says, if you want to go over to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 2, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, is that... You know, uh, so he's his nephew, and that's going to come into play later. You know, there's an application to be made here. That's why I'm pointing this out. Okay, <clears throat> it said in verse 39, "And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me." So these men, uh, Joab, his brothers, Asahel, they are uh, the sons of Zeruiah. <clears throat> so who is Zeruiah? Well, that's David's sister. It says there in First Chronicles. Chapter 2, verse 13, And Jesse, which is David's father, begat his firstborn Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shema the, the third, and Nathaniel the fourth, Radei the fifth, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh, whose sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail, and the sons of Zeruiah, Abishai and Joab, and Esahel three. So this is, you know, normally in the scripture, when it says the sons of somebody, it's referring to the father. But in this instance, it's actually referring to their mother, Zeruiah, the sister of David, so we see here that, that Joab and Asahel and Abishai, these are actually David's nephews, okay? And <clears throat> here's the thing about it, uh, you know, that doesn't change the way David feels about um, Joab and what he's done, okay? In fact, Joab, if you want to go over to 2 Samuel chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9, Joab is disliked by David. That's my opinion. I don't think that David was a big fan of Joab and Abishai and Asahel. I don't think, because he says there in verse 39 where we ended in 2 Samuel 3 that these sons of Zeruiah, plural, you know, be too hard for me. He's saying these guys are too hard for me. I don't, I don't like having to deal with them. They vex me. You know, every time they get involved, things go bad. Uh, so I don't think jo that uh, Joab is somebody that David was particularly fond of, okay? And it says there in... Uh, <clears throat> And, I'll, you know, because this, this phrase comes up more than once where he says this of them. He says, you know, these sons of Zeruiah, they be too hard for me. That's not just a one-off. Like, he repeats himself. He, this, is, this is David's opinion of them. He's saying these guys are too hard. And really, when we look at what they're like, is they're, they're cruel people. You know, they're, they're people who are interested only in power and position. And that's probably why Joe, or excuse me, David didn't like him. Because what we know about David is that that's not him. You know, he's somebody who uh, wasn't power hungry. You know, he, he waited for the throne. He honored Saul, even when he was trying, he could have taken him out. We, we know that. We went through 1 Samuel, right? That he was one that was able to, you know, put that off. He didn't have to be the king, but he was made king. So, you know, you could see why he wouldn't like somebody like this, okay? <clears throat> why he would say that about that they are too hard for him. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So this is Abishai, Joab's brother, talking about Shimei. When, when Absalom's rebellion took place and David's fleeing, then, you know, Shimei comes along and he starts cursing the king, King David, you know, for the blood of Saul. And he's throwing rocks at him as he goes and curses him. And Abishai is saying, hey, let me go take his head off. You know, let me go cut his head off. And David, you know, he doesn't even really express, you know, an appreciation for this, you know, this apparent display of loyalty. Where he's like, well, look, I appreciate the gesture that you would go cut somebody's head off for me. 
but don't do it. What he says is, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So this is kind of, you know, I'm trying to connect the dots here and, and just take David at his word. It seems to me like these sons of Zeruiah are people that kind of just attach themselves to David. They kind of, oh, you know, our cousins become the king. Let's go hang out with him. You know, let's get some of that glory. Let's see if we can't get in the cabinet. Let's see if we can't get a position. And he kind of goes along with it, okay? You're there in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 21. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death? This is when they're coming back after they defeated Absalom. Uh, put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed. And David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So he says it again. You know, it's the same instance again. He's saying, Look, you didn't let me cut him his head off when we left, but now we're coming back. Now can I go cut his head off? Now can we put him to death? He's saying, look, what do I have to do with you, you sons of Zariah, that you should this day be adversaries unto me? He's like, you're going to make me look bad. You're going to make me look like you. You're going to, you know, you're, un, you're merciless. You don't have any compassion. You know, you're, you're too hard, right? That's what he said about him. But what does he mean by that? He says, look, you're too hard. What he's saying is that, and when we, when we read about these guys and what they're like, is that they're cruel people. You know, Joab was a cruel person. Abishai here is, is proving himself to be, you know, have bloodlust. He just wants to, you know, cut people's heads off over, you know, somebody cursing. Even Asahel, you know, he pursued Abner. Even after Abner turned around and said, hey, stop, aren't you his, you know, how am I going to lift up my face to your brother Joab? Stop following me. And he wouldn't. And he pursued him. He told him twice, you need to go away. And then he eventually kills him because it was came down to, you know, it's either going to be me or you. So Abner said, well, it's going to be you, buddy. But it shows you again that these, these three sons of Zeruiah, they have this kind of, uh, you know, this bloodlust. They're cruel people. They're megalomaniacs. At least I believe that about Joab. Joab is a cruel person. Go back to 2 Samuel. If you want to bookmark 2 Samuel 19, we'll be back. But go back to 2 Samuel chapter number 3. We're going to look at verse 26. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent, uh, come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner and brought him again uh, from the well of Sariah, but David knew it not. <clears throat> Verse 27, and when David, excuse me, when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak quietly uh, with him quietly and smote him there into the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. So it tells us what happens here is this, there's this vindictive, uh, you know, slaying of, of, uh, of Abner. This wasn't a justified killing. You know, what Abner did to Asahel was justified because that was war. You know, they had gone out to fight, and, he, and he's telling them, look, you need to turn back. He wanted to spare Asahel. We read that when we went through 2 Samuel chapter 2. You know, he wanted to spare him. He, he, for this very instance, he's like, look, I'm going to have to look Joab in the face. And he was, you know, they were winning the battle. He's like, you need to just turn around. You guys won. You beat us. You know, why are you pursu pursuing me? And then he keeps pursuing him. So that was a justified killing. You know, there's a difference between murder and killing somebody. You know, if you're killing somebody, you know, when you're defending your country or defending your life, that's not, it, yes, it's killing somebody, but murder is, when, is like an act of maliciousness. It's when you're, you're going out of your way to, you know, just kill somebody for no good reason at all. Or maybe, you know, you have it justified in your head, but a court of law would look at it and say, actually, that was, you know, cold-blooded murder, okay? So what Abner, uh, or what um, Joab does here to Abner is unjustified. Right, and you could tell by the way he does it. You know, he does it sneakily. He's like, "Hey, I gotta talk to you. Come over here." And then he he kind of pulls the wool over his eyes and and kind of gets out of the sight. You know, over into uh, you know takes him aside into the gate, right where nobody's really around to see what happens, and he, he kills him under the fifth rib. And this is this is you know our first clue about the 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 character of Joab and why Joab in the scripture is a bad example. It's not somebody you want to to be like. Okay, he's not somebody we should look to. <clears throat> And on top of that, are you still in 2 Samuel 3? If you look at verse 31, you know, he's not even remorseful. You know, sometimes when somebody does something bad, they'll at least kind of feel bad about it. They'll say, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Right? But if you look at verse 31, you can see that Joab doesn't even feel bad about it. He's glad that he did this. Because if you look at verse 31, David has to tell him to mourn. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes. You know, he had to tell him that because he wasn't doing it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I killed him, so what? He said, well, you know what? You need to rend your clothes, and you need to gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. So, I mean, yeah, he might have done all that, but the only reason he did it is because the king commanded of him. You know, this wasn't something that he felt bad about. I don't believe that. <clears throat> and he said, and mourn before Abner. And the king David bowed himself before 
the deer. So we see some things about the character of Joab. And one is the fact that he is a cruel person. And the other is that he's unremorseful. And I believe that he is a picture in scripture of somebody that is a megalomaniac. Somebody who is obsessed with power. Someone who will do anything to get whatever power they can. If you're there, did I, you kept something in 2 Samuel 19. Go back there. Go to verse 11. I'll begin reading in 2 Samuel 19, verse 11. And it says, And King David sent to Zadok and to Abathar, the Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, <clears throat> saying, Why are you come out at the last to bring back the king back to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel's come to the king, even to his house. Ye are my brethren, ye are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are ye not the, are the last to bring back the king? <laughs> and saying ye to Amasa, who was with you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Absalom, right? He's coming back in, he's taking back the kingdom. And he's saying, say to Amasa, art thou now bone of my, not of my bone and of my flesh? God so do to me, do so to me, and more also, if thou be not the captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. So by 2 Samuel 19, Joab has taken the position of the captain of, of David's host. And now when they're coming back into the kingdom after, you know, Joab slew his son after he was told not, you know, he kills Absalom and David specifically said, spare him. But Joab goes ahead and kills him anyway, okay? So now David is saying, you know what? I'm just going to replace Joab as the captain with, with Amasa, right? He's coming back in and say, hey, you're going to be the captain before me continually in the room of Joab. And Joab, you know, go over to verse, or chapter 20. Chapter 20, being the, the humble guy that he is, who just wants to serve the king, is just there for all the right reasons. You know, he just says, you know what? I'm just happy to be uh, in the service of the king to whatever degree you want. No, he's, he's like, oh, you're going to make somebody else captain? Well, look what happens, right? If you know the story, it says in verse 9, And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? So again, he's taking, just like he did before with Abner, where he's being secretive. Hey, I got to talk to you. Come over here. You know, he's, he's, he's being very crafty. He's not facing, he's kind of a coward. He's not just coming right out trying to fight him. <clears throat> I mean, Abner, you know, maybe, maybe that's the reason why, because Abner killed Asahel. Like, he didn't have any problem running him through. You know, he might have been a better soldier. You know, these guys might have been better than Joab, and Joab didn't like that, so he's using deceit here. Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. So if that ever happens to you, you know, you got, you got issues, right? All the clean-shaven guys are like, not a problem, brother. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> I'd have an issue right there. You know, you grab me by the beard, and I start, you start puckering up, like, sword or not, it's going down. But anyway, <clears throat> he said, uh, he takes him by the right hand to kiss him, but Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So if you know the story, he, he fakes like the, the, the sword fell out of his girdle, and he's like, oh, Arthur are throwing health, and he's picking it up. You know, just like, oh, I'm just going to put this back in the sheath, you know. But he, he hangs on to it while they have this exchange. And it says, and he, so he smote them therewith in the fifth rib. That's like his favorite place, I guess. And shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, meaning he put so much force and did so much damage that there was no need to, to, to kill him again or to hit him again. You know, he, he can, it, you can kind of see the picture that the, the Bible's painting here. It's, it's pretty graphic where he's smiting him and then shedding out his bowels. He's like slicing his belly open, right? And struck him not again, and he died. So jo Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So this is, you know, uh, we're getting some insight here into the character of Joab. And it's important to understand what he's like because he's a major character in David's life. He plays a major part. He's a, he's a you know, I wouldn't say he's a main character, but he's definitely a significant character in the Old Testament. And when we see about him, and if you would, is uh, go over to Acts chapter, tw Acts chapter number 20 is the fact that, you know, if he can't be king, you know, captain is the next best thing. He'll take that. I mean, if he could get away with it, he would probably go ahead and just get the kingdom. But he knows that there's no overthrowing David. You know, the people love David. Whatsoever he does pleases the people. The people wanted him to be king. The Lord is with him. You know, he knows that you can't overthrow the king. So I'm just going to attach myself to him and just keep myself as high up in rank as I can. And that's, the, that's the, who this guy is. He's a megalomaniac. He's somebody who wants power as much as he can get and is willing to hurt other people to get it. If he can't be king, captain's the next best thing. And that's what he's in it for. <clears throat> and I want to point this out. I want to take the time because 
you know, this is in the scripture for the reason. Whenever I'm doing these studies, I always have to ask myself, what is God trying to show us by telling us the story? It's not just this narrative that God just threw in there because, you know, it just makes for good storytelling. There's a principle here. There's something that God wants us to see and understand. And what I believe he's pointing out is the fact that wicked people will attach themselves to good people. I mean, my opinion, maybe you disagree, is that Joab is a wicked man. When he's killing people multiple times, deceitfully, not in war, for his own gain, just because he, he's, he's power hungry, he doesn't want to lose his office, just because he's, you know, taking vengeance on somebody, you know, he, that makes you a wicked person and when, you, when you're killing people to do that. He's a wicked man. But what we see is that he's attached to a very good man. And King David was a very good man. He was, you know, he was anointed of the Lord. But what we see is that wicked people attach themselves to good people. This is a principle that we have to understand. And I believe God put it in the scripture for us because this, people can, can hear about this and they can be told this. But until you actually see it happen, you'll say, oh, no way. Well, you know, maybe back in David's day, but there's no, people aren't like that today. Oh, yes, they are. There's people like this that exist even today. That are that want that that see a good a good person a good church, you know good work taking place and they will attach themselves to that for their own personal gain, and then in time they will show themselves to be what they really are wicked people, that are you know maybe not murderers but to some degree megalomaniacs people who just want power, people who just want notoriety people who just want a following as what well, and the Paul warns about it in Acts chapter twenty, in Acts chapter twenty over in uh, verse twenty nine. Okay, when he calls the elders of Ephesus, he's getting ready to depart to go back to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So he's saying this to all the pastors in Ephesus, the elders of Ephesus. And he's saying, look, this is going to happen even in your day. There's going to be, uh, when I depart, when I go, you know, when, when, the, when, the, <clears throat> you know when, the, when the cat's away, the mice will play kind of a thing. He's like, look, when I'm gone, when I'm not here to be vigilant and run these people out and, and watch over things, that's when these grievous wolves are going to enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And look at verse 30. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And look, we could preach this, and people will still, and I, I had to see it happen more than once before I realized that like, this is something that happens on a regular, like I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen again. I'm sure that somebody at some point is going to attach themselves to this church. Somebody's going to come to this church, and they're going to be an infiltrator. They're going to be a Judas for these exact same purposes. They want to want draw disciples away after them. You say, has that ever happened? Yes, it has. We've had people come in, get in positions of authority in this church in faithful word, and then begin to stretch what perverse things. You know, we we use that word perverse to mean like you know perverted in that context, but it could mean just things that are not right, just things that are crooked, perverse, right? False doctrine, damnable heresies, right? Is what they bring in, denying, you know, the Trinity, teaching oneness, you know, behind the pastor's back, teaching it to a group of people, and then what, drawing away, and then, then when they get caught and called out and kicked out, what happens? They draw away disciples after them, and they move to Florida, and they start a church, and their name is Tyler Baker. You know, that's, that's, that kind of thing happens. <clears throat> so you say, well, that would ever happen? It's already happened. You know, and, I, and I'm sure it will happen again, where people will creep in just to do harm, to inflict damage, to draw us away disciples after them. Because we see this principle all the way back with King David, that bad people attach themselves to good people. Wicked people attach themselves to righteous people for their own personal gain. And they don't care who they hurt in the process. They don't care about the damage they do in the process. Joab was to had to be told, look, you need to rend your clothes. You need to mourn. You need to put on sackcloth. Even if you're not sorry, you should at least look like it. Because you look like a jerk. <laughs> you know, because you just killed a good man named Abner. That's the type of people. See, go over to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. The Bible warns us about this. Say, well, maybe in Paul's day, you know, maybe that happened. <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, maybe, yeah, all the way back in David's day, but do you really think that kind of thing goes on? Yes, it does. It does happen. Now, I'm not saying people are going to come in here and grab you by the beard, smoke you on know, the fifth rib, but they're going to try and do damage to this body. They're going to try and do damage to this church. You know, we're still kind of small right now. You know, maybe, maybe there's not a lot of interest for wicked people to come in here and try to do that, 
But I guarantee you, the longer we go <clears throat> and as this church grows, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time till this type of thing happens. And I'm just warning you today that we see this principle in Scripture that wicked people attach themselves to good people. There in Jude chapter 1, uh, which is the only chapter, look at verse 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write any of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto, uh, unto the saints. So he's saying, look, I wanted to write you the common salvation, but then I realized I needed to write unto you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Why? Well, he says in verse 4, for there are certain men crept in. They're already there, unawares. They've crept in. And how did they creep in? They didn't walk in and say, hey, I'm a Judas. Hey, I believe in some damnable heresy. Hey, I'm here to draw away disciples after me. And that's not how Joab do it, did it. He didn't walk up to Abner. Hey, let's go over here so I can smoke you into the fifth rib. You know, he didn't, he didn't walk up and say, let me we'll grab you by the beard so I can kill you. He said, art thou in health, brother? You know, they, they creep in. They do it unawares. And that's why we can't go on this, you know, you always got to preach, whenever you preach this, you got to also kind of put the little asterisk in there. It's like, we're not going on a witch hunt, by the way. Don't start looking around going, who is it? You know, there might not be anyone like that in here. But I'm just saying it's only a matter of time until there is somebody in here who is like that, who wants to come in and creep in, like it says in Jude chapter 1, verse 4, certain men are crept in unawares who were before ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to deny God. You know, they're teaching damnable heresy. That's what these people are like. They creep in. <clears throat> they attach themselves to good people, to righteous churches, to good churches, to men of God. Look at verse 12. These are spots in your feasts. They're in there. They're among you. They're going to, even of your own selves shall men arise. They're already among you. <clears throat> they are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You know, the reprobates, in many instances, that's what they are. Judas being very specific and telling them these particular people are reprobates. And you say, is that really possible? Yes. And what's crazy about it is when you see this happen time and time again, I'm not saying like on a regular basis, but boy, it seems, you know, in the last, in the eight years that I've been here, I've seen it more than once you know, some degree or another. And what's crazy about it is that sometimes I think these people that creep in, these reprobates that creep in and try to bring down a church or split a church or teach damnable heresies, a lot of time they don't even know they are what they are. I'm convinced of that. That to me, that's just a frightening thought, to, to be an instrument of the devil and not even know it. I mean, think about that. I mean, they, they come in here, they try to split the church, you know, they try to t tear down the pastor, teach some damnable heresy, whatever it is. Why? You know, if I, if, I, if I loathed some church, if I hated some man of God or I hated some church, I just wouldn't go there. It's a, it's a very strange thing that people would stick around for years in a church. And then, you know, when they see an opportunity, try to spring some trap and split a church. That's wicked. That's, you know, that's demonic is what that is. And, they, and you tell them that, you know, you're being used to Satan. Well, no, I'm not. They don't even know they are. I mean, do you think Judas, did Judas know Satan, Satan entered into him? I don't know, did he? <laughs> I tend to think not. I tend to think he didn't. I think he just, you know, and I think that Satan even today has his little sleeper cells that he creeps into churches, and when he sees an opportunity, he just flips the switch, and he just winds them up and just sets them down, and t -t 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 -t, you know, like those little stupid toys. And they, whatever, they can just run around trying to knock stuff over or whatever. And they just do whatever they're going to do. <clears throat> they're, they are, they, hey, look, the Bible's showing us time and time again. They creep in, they do damage, and it's going to happen again. It's only a matter of time. So that's the type of guy Joab. Now, was Joab a reprobate? I'm not going to go so far as to say he's some kind of wicked infiltrator reprobate. But he was definitely a megalomaniac. He was definitely somebody who was, wanted power. He's power hungry. You know, the guy had issues for sure, okay? <clears throat> Go over to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. You know, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit in the book, but let's look at You say, well, how, how is it that Joab, what are you telling me, Joab's a bad guy? You know, yeah, he made some mistakes. He killed a few people. But is he, I mean, he's the, he's the captain of the Lord. Uh, he's the captain of David's host. Why would David promote a guy like that? You know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of still thinking about exactly, you know, 
why David allowed this to happen or David meant for this to happen. But when you, when you look at the way in which Joab came to be the captain, it even shows you that he's still kind of a cruel, he did it through a cruel way. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, okay, in verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. Because remember, they have, you know, Jerusalem was still being controlled by the Jebusites. It was called Jebus. They went unto Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which, and which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in thither. So they see David and his men coming. They're like, okay. And I mean, David's known at this point as one bad dude. When David shows up at your town, like you might as well just surrender, okay? Because it's, it's going down. So what's going on here when they say, except thou take away the blind and the lame? Well, <clears throat> you know, this is kind of a sermon when I get there, but what I think is going on here is that they're actually using people as like human shields. You know, they're, they're going to try and scale these walls. They're going to try to come into the town. So they're they're putting in the, the blind and the lame, you know, to try to, to keep them from coming in. Some like that. Something's going on like that. And you say, no one does stuff like that. Look, they still do that today. I was watching some video about, uh, you know, those Black Hawk helicopters that went down in Mogadishu years ago. That, they did that. They, they, they had to kill civilians and stuff like that because the, you know, the whatever they were, the terrorists or whatever regime that was there, they would, when they were trying to attack those soldiers, they would, they would, you know, they would put some guy out there on a donkey and they would stand behind him and try and shoot. And then they would eventually had no choice. They had to start killing civilians. Otherwise they were all going to die. And people do that all the time. You know, they'll, they, they, even today they'll use, you know, innocence as human shields. And they say, look, except thou come away and take away the blind and lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Meaning you're going to have to go through these people, right? And they know that, you know, David is somebody who's known for being merciful and doesn't want to, you know, shed innocent blood. They know that, you know, the God of the Bible condemns shedding of innocent blood. So they're thinking, ah, oh, we got them, right? And it's kind of an interesting story. I really haven't, you know, fleshed all this out. But it does show you that how Joab came into being captain here. Because it goes on, it says, in verse 7, Nevertheless, nevertheless David took the stronghold of Zion, the same, the same as the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, and smite at the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. You say, why would he kill them? Well, if you remember, the Jebusites were one of the seven Canaanite nations that God said to wipe out. So he's hated of David's soul. But he says, whoever goes up there and kills these lame and blind, they're going to be captain. You know, and even if and we read it, we're kind of like, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> I don't know if I could go kill a blind person. <laughs> even if it's some wicked nation that God wants to destroy what, I mean, me personally, I would feel kind of weird about that. <laughs> you know, go kill some lame guy. You know, taking, I'm going to go beat up somebody. You know, I, I got in a fight the other day. You should see this guy. I whooped him. Oh, really? Yeah, he's in a wheelchair. <laughs> you like, you look at me like, you're cruel. You know, you're picking on some blind person, you know, somebody who's lame. But David says, hey, whoever goes up and does that, they're going to be chief and captain. And I won't have you go back to First Chronicles, but... If you read the parallel passage in verse 11, guess who went up there? And had no problem just wiping out the lame. It was just the first guy up the ladder like, oh, you need somebody to kill somebody? I'm the guy for the job. Because, he, you know, Joab's the type of guy, he'll kill anybody. I mean, he's killing Abner. He's killing this guy. He's like, hey, I'll go up to Jeb. He's like, what? I get to be chief captain? I get to be over the, the army? Yeah, step aside. You know, worth it. You know, and so he goes up there, and it says that he uh, – uh, uh, thou shalt, nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, and David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went first up and was chief. So that's how he came in. It wasn't that David was like, you know, Joab, you're such a, such a good guy. You know, you're just such a faithful man. You're, you know, you're, you're, you have so much integrity. I, I just want you to be the, the chief captain. No, it's because he, I, and again, it seems, you kind of read the story. It's like, is David... Did David know that Joab would be willing to do it, and that's why he made it happen? I don't know. But that's how, either way, that's how Joab came into being the chief captain. It wasn't through being promoted through his, you know, his good deeds. You know, it wasn't his good merit that got him exalted. It was the fact that he was willing to get his hands dirty and do wicked things. You say, well, that's great. You know, well, why are you preaching that? <laughs> well, what's the application here? How can I use this? Well, Here's, here's the application. Don't be like Joab. Don't be like this guy. You know, we should even in a little bit, you know, now I'm not suspecting anybody here is going to, 
you know, try and take me by the beard and smoke me on the fifth rib later. But we should be merciful people. Okay, we should be merciful people. Go over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Don't be like Joab. It's the first application. Don't be like this guy. You know, we might not want to smite people under their fifth rib. But you know what? Sometimes we can get vindictive. Maybe we do want to be a little vengeful. You know, maybe the dogs next door are just barking a little too much, a little too long at night. I mean, you think, well, if I just whip up that batch of raw bread dough with extra leaven in it, put some extra, and I just throw it over there, and then their guts will explode. And... <laughs> Not that that's ever gone through my mind, you know. <laughs> but we think things like this, don't we? Someone does us dirty, someone does us wrong. We don't like something that's going on. We think, well, I'm going to get back. I'm going to get that guy back. I'm going to get that person back. You know, then you find yourself out in the parking lot in the middle of the night letting some air out of someone's tires, right? <laughs> I've never done it. I'm just trying to think of examples, okay? Who's ever done something really bad? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Help me out here. Interactive preaching night. You say, well, I'm never going to do what Joab did. Yeah, we might not do it to that extreme. We might not go do all the things he did. We're going to start, you know, we're going to go and start, you know, hurting the lame and the blind. But you know what? That all can, you know, we have the potential to be just as cruel. You know, we might not do those bad things, but we can be vengeful. We can be unmerciful with people. The Bible says not to do that. The Bible said in Leviticus chapter 19, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, that's the second greatest commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself. He's saying you're not going to bear grudge against any of the children of thy people. I mean, that was Joab was guilty of that. I mean, that's what Abner was. He was the children of his people, and he had a grudge against him, and he took vengeance on him. He was an unmerciful man. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man. You say, well, I, I, I understand, you know, to the children of thy people, the Bible says in Leviticus. You know, I, I'm not going to do, you know, if someone you know, offends me in church, I'm not going to get back at them. But if some lost heathen out there in the world does me dirty, you better believe I'm going to come down on them like a ton of bricks. Well, the Bible says recompense to no man evil for evil. To no man, nobody. We should never be these vengeful people that just want to get back at people, you know. Here's a great example, you know, road rage, right? Someone cuts you off, it's like, well, I'm going to I'm going to cut him off and then I'm going to break check him and you know, people do that kind of stuff all the time. That's why I just don't do anymore anymore. <laughs> is that, you know, you don't know how that person's going to react. Things escalate. You know, you drive by with some of these, these wrecks on the side of the highway, it's like you wonder what happened. Was it just an accident, or is it two people, you know, were just being vengeful against each other at high speeds? You know, that's a kind of bringing it, let's bring it into a modern-day context that we can actually apply to our lives. You know, that's just the one that comes to my mind. And, but there, and we could think of other examples where, where people do this type of thing, where they want to be spiteful, they want to be vengeful, against somebody that does them wrong. <clears throat> Recompense to no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceable with, peaceably with all men. You know, we should be the type of people that seek peace. We should be the type of people that just want to be at peace with people. You know, instead of whipping up that batch of, of leaven-laden dough and killing the neighbor's dog, I'm just going to turn the fan on and drown out the noise in the back, and I'll fall asleep like a, like a baby, right? And then my neighbor can still have his dog, and I can get a good night's rest, and we can still be friends, right? We can still be at peace. We can still not, uh, you know, ha have done evil to somebody. <clears throat> if it be possible as much as lieth in you with all men. Now, obviously, there's a point where we have to defend ourselves, right? We understand that. As much as is possible and as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. It's, at some point, we have to, you know, put the peace aside and stand up for what's right, defend what's ours. But you know what? That's a long way off. You know, a lot of times, you know, and, and here, here's an example, you know, people who carry guns. You know, I, ca I carried a gun in my last job, and my boss told me, he encouraged it. He said, look, I, you know, I want you to conceal carry. I want, and I was working as a locksmith, going into people's houses, going to places of business, He's like, I believe in the second. I carry, he said. You know, I encourage all my guys to get their CCW and carry. And he said, but here's my rule. He's like, when you come to work, you leave one of two things at home. You either leave your gun at home or you leave your temper at home. He said, you don't bring both. And what he's getting across is that, you know, if you're, if you're 
uh, the type of person going to carry a gun, you can't have a short fuse with people. Because there's this, and I've noticed about some people, I've met people who carry guns. I'm like, that guy shouldn't carry a gun because he has a short fuse. And they like to brag about it. I remember this one guy came in, I was working somewhere, and he's talking about, yeah, I, I pulled out of my, my driveway, and I backed out real fast. And I almost hit this other guy in a motorcycle. And then he was, they were road raging, just like I was talking about, right? And then he's like, and I had my pistol right there the whole time. And I rolled down my window at the red light. We were young. And he's just telling me I got in this altercation and how he was just like, I had my hand on my gun. The guy didn't even know. It. I'm just thinking like, you shouldn't have a gun, dude. <laughs> you know, and is that you think that's going to go down? You're going to shoot this guy and the cops are going to show up and be like, what happened? Well, first I backed out of my driveway and nearly clipped him. And then we got into it. And he called me this and, and I called him that. And then I shot him. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're free to go. <laughs> that's not how it's going to go. You're going to get booked. You're going to go to jail. You're going to get, you know, probably on some degree murder brought up on charges. Even, you know, and let me just, while we're on the subject, you know, talking about guns and carrying, you know, one thing my boss told me that was very eye-opening for me as somebody who carries a gun, he said, and I don't know whether this is true, I just took it as fact, but I could see, you know, that it probably is true, that most, 80% of people that shoot somebody, even in a justified shooting, where they kill somebody else, and it's 100% justified, they end up bankrupt and divorced, 80% of them. 80% because the people get this mentality it's like a video game like if I, well, if I just shoot somebody and they had it coming it was me or them then you know I'll, I'll, I'll still be able to I'll feel fine about that not necessarily you know maybe maybe the cops will say hey you could yeah you were justified but maybe you'll go back in your mind and go man if I had just done this or I just said that or if I just walked away or you know what I mean those it would plague you to take somebody's life is a big deal you know even if it's someone you that the world would just perceive as some scumbag you know, it's still, I mean, especially as a Christian, we know, well, I just killed that person. Was he even saved? And 80% of people I've been told that end up killing somebody, even in a justified shooting, end up bankrupt and divorced because it just alters their life. And you say, why bankrupt? Because unless you can prove it, like, unless you have, like, multiple witnesses and, camp, you know, video evidence to clear, clear your name, you're still going to get booked, you're still going to go to jail, and you're still going to have to go to court and hire a lawyer and prove that what you did was justified. And that's all very expensive, by the way. So, you, you know, there goes all your money. Now, I get it. If, if it's me or them, it's going to be them. <laughs> you know, and if, if I go bankrupt, so be it. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to make the point that, you know, we don't want to be people that have a short fuse. We want to be people, we want as much as possible to be at peace with all men. You know, if it came down to me getting into a, a scrap with somebody, let, let's say, you know, when could this possibly happen? Oh, I don't know, out soul winning. You know, when you're going out you know, in the, and you know, go out every week and you're knocking multiple doors, you, you think that maybe you might some, run into somebody who just had having a bad day or just hates God or just doesn't like to look on your face and decided today's the day. I'm going to take it out on this guy. You know, I'm going to grab him by the tie and just go at it. Look, if it came down to me or that, if it came, if I got in a situation, soul winning, wherever, where I had two options, either get into a fight or run away, I would run away. I would just swallow my pride and run away. I, oh, you're a chick and you're a coward. Yeah, but I don't have any scrapes. As much as is possible. Was it possible for me to run? Now, granted, I couldn't run very far. <laughs> right? The van's never that far away, folks. <laughs> I would run away, and then I would lightly jog away, and then I would probably limp the rest of the way. Okay, <laughs> and then I would go lay down somewhere. But that's what I would do, because I'm not trying to prove anything. And look, the Bible says as much as is possible. Look, we don't want to be vengeful people. We don't want to, and these are obviously extreme cases. But if we're honest, you know, we if we really watched, you know, the way we think or the way we feel about people, especially when they do something towards us that we don't like, when they offend us in some way, you know, we might find ourselves feeling vengeful. You know, maybe we won't do anything, but boy, we wish we could. We wish we could get them back and show them what's what, you know, and teach them a lesson. You know, the Bible doesn't teach that. We're not to be vengeful people. He said, as much as is possible, live peacefully with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Give place unto wrath. You know, if wrath comes, we're to give place to it. We're not to resist that. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will pay, say it, the Lord. <clears throat> you know, and that's why I'm not going to, you know, I'm not heading for the hills if the tribulation comes. I'm going to give place to wrath. You know, if they come and they want to 
take my head off or they want to do whatever, I'm giving place to wrath because God will repay. I'm not going to go find a bunker and, you know, and, and rack the AR and start eating rations, you know, and, and start trying to take out as many of the, you know, the one world, you know, satanic force, you know, the murder death robots that the new world order is going to send, you know, whatever. Like people get into this stuff. They're thinking, you know, when the, when the, when the Antichrist comes, I'm going to be that guy that's, I'm starting to take out as many people as I can, all these wicked reprobates, the, you know, the reprobate army of the Antichrist. It's like, no, I'm going to give place to wrath and I'm going to let God repay. Because if we know our Bibles, God, boy, he pours it out, doesn't he? And he repays pretty good. A lot better than I could do with, you know, a few rounds or whatever. That's an extreme example, obviously, right? But that mentality is out there. And, and even if it's something, you know, where somebody's doing us wrong, you know, they're trying to hurt us, you know, people that have tried to hurt this church, people that have, you know, <clears throat> doxed our church members, brought up dirt out of their past, people that have had to, you know, try to attack our pastor, attack his family, you know, those people, God repaid, God vent, said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know, and they, you know, in a, in a short time later, people were making these, you know, YouTube attack channels where they're just lying and trying to bring down the man of God, trying to stop the work of Christ, showing up at, you know, preaching conferences and trying to disrupt things, trying to expose the new IFB or whatever, you know, and they're just railing and lying and just enemies of the cause of Christ. You know, one of those people was found literally in an alley with his skull caved in. And I was like, oh, coincidence. No, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. He said, well, you shouldn't glory in that. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm glad God pays back. I'm, God glad, I'm, I'm glad I gave place to wrath and let God take care of it. You know, and I've talked to people. They, they, they say, boy, it'd be really nice to go find out where that, you know, internet bozo lives who's making these channels and, 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 and dragging people's names through the mud and trying to, I'd like to find out where he lives and just show up with a ski mask and, and, and do some dental work, you know, and, and feed him his teeth. But you know what? The Bible says to give plate to wrath. Let God repay those people because he does a lot better job. So we should never have this attitude where we just feel like we have to right every wrong because really a lot of times that can turn out to us just being vindictive and vengeful. And, and then God says, well, if you're going to try and take care of it, then I'm not going to do my thing. And I'd rather just let God do his thing because he makes it and he, he cleans up nice. <clears throat> so don't be like Joab. Don't be a vengeful person. Don't be somebody who has to be in power. Be a humble person. You know, that's, I mean, that's what motivated Joab, wasn't it? Go over to, uh, go over to Philippians chapter 2. I'm almost done. You know, what's the application tonight? When we're looking at the bad example of Joab. You know, Joab was a guy who was vengeful somebody who was merciless, somebody who had no compassion, somebody who was vindictive and vengeful. He had no mercy, but what motivated him? What was his motive to kill Abner? What was his motive to kill these other people? It's because he wanted power. Why did he kill Amasa? Because he, wanted, he didn't want his position to be taken away from him. Why was he the first one up the ladder to, you know, to take out the Jebusites, even the, lime, the, the, the lame and the blind? Because he wanted that position, right? Because he was a proud person, okay? We should not, we should be merciful. We should be humble. Jesus said in Mark 10, Ariti, he said, I mean, this is very familiar, but I know we all know this. He said, it, it, uh, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. You know, let him be your minister. Well, I want to be great. Well, then be a servant. Be a minister. You know, humble yourselves in the mighty hand, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. You know, draw an eye to the Lord. Humble yourselves. <clears throat> he said, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever will be your chiefest, whoever's going to be the captain, right, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to minister, be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You say, well, I don't know if I like that. I don't like this idea about being humble and, and you know, if I want to be exalted, I serve. Well, that's the example of Christ. You know, and if it's good enough for him, you know, it's good enough for us. That, you know, we should, we should be willing to go along with that. That sounds like a good plan to me. And here's the thing. If everybody does that and just says, hey, you know what? I'm going to exalt others better than myself. I'm, you know, like we're in Philippians, right? It says in verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but also every man on the things of others. You know, I'm not just going to be worried about myself. I'm going to worry about other people, see how I can help them, how I can bless them, you know, and, and, and forgive them. 
and do good to them and not be vengeful towards them and care about them. You know, if we do that, if we all do that, then we're all going to get along. Everybody, you know, if we all love our neighbor as ourselves, guess what? We all get along, don't we? Because we're all too busy loving each other to try and do each other harm, right? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. That's not Joab. (laughs) Joab had to have a reputation, and he certainly wasn't much of a servant. I mean, yeah, he served David, but he was he was in it for his own gain. He was in it for his own reputation. He was in it for his own exaltation, right? Because he had to get that power. So the first application is this, and I'll wrap up, is don't be like Joab, okay? Don't be like him. Be a merciful person. Be a humble person. And here's the second application. Beware of the Joabs in your life. You see, well, I'm not going to be a Joab, but you know what? We also have to be aware of the Joabs in our lives. If you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 3, second, keep something in Romans. If you're, You probably already turned away. Just forget it. But 2 Samuel chapter number 3, 2 Samuel chapter number 3, And I'm going to point this out because you might have missed this, but it's just one little verse, just one little kind of dig that, that Joab has towards King David. Beware of the Joabs in your life. Joab was a manipulative person. He liked to manipulate people. He was manipulating David a little bit here. You know, there's that, there's that term that gets thrown around a lot today, you know, gaslighting, which is basically when you're telling somebody that their perception of reality isn't right. Like, oh, you think this is going on, but that's not really what's going on. This is what's going on. This is the truth right? You're wrong about, oh, you think it's like this, but that's not the way it is. Let me tell you how it really is. You know, you're going crazy. You know, your perception of reality, the way you're perceiving things you're, you're, is wrong. That's what Joab does to the king here. You even have an example in scripture, verse six, 2 Samuel 3, verse 24. Then Joab came to the king and said, what hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away? And he is quite gone. Now, we know what, Abner really wa- or what uh, Joab really wanted. He wanted his opportunity to kill Abner. Thou knowest, verse 25, look at this. Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee. Is that why Abner was there? Look, the, the narrator of the scripture tells us that he was there to make a league with him. That he, he, was, he was turning over the kingdom to him because his loyalty wasn't being appreciated by Ishbosheth. You know, he's sticking it out over there trying to make things work. And Ishbosheth, that's a weak leader, and it's not happening. So he says, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and fight God. Let's just go over to David then. If that's God's will, we're going to do that. Abner was a good man. He was doing the right thing. You know, this is Joab's perception, but he's telling it to the king. He's saying, thou knowest, when he did, that that Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee. He's gaslighting him. It's like, you, you know, this is what really happened here, that he's coming to deceive thee. And to know thy going in, thy coming out, and to know all that thou doest. He's trying to, you know, twist reality. He's trying to paint this other, uh, you know, picture of what's actually going on. And he's kind of telling it to him in a way like, well, this is what's really happening. You know, you're wrong, David, to think that that's what's going on. This is what's actually happening. What he's doing is he's manipulating him. He's manipulating him. So you need to look out for people like this in your life. They're going to be people that are going to try and manipulate you, you know, and it's why, so they can get what they want out of you, okay, and, and use you. Beware of the Joabs in your life. And I don't want to go on and on about that. You say, well, how? How do you avoid the Joabs in your life? Well, be impartial. Be impartial. Well, don't think, don't, what I mean by that is don't sit there and think, well, so-and-so would never be like that. Well, I'll remind you that this is Joab, is, is David's nephew. See how I started that in the beginning? And he could have said, well, this is my nephew. This is the son of my sister, Zeruiah. Obviously, she, you know, he... They wouldn't want to do me any harm. Obviously, he's, you know, he's only got my best interest in mind. No, he has his own interest in mind. And that's why he's gaslighting David and trying to make him think it's something else is going on so that he can get his hands on Abner and get him killed. <clears throat> and this is something we have to keep in mind is that we, if we're going to avoid, if we're going to look, be on the lookout for the Abners, and, 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 and whether it's in our own lives or how about this, in our churches, you know, and this is something that, this is a big lesson that I've learned, you know, in the short time that I've been in the ministry is the importance of being impartial with people. Because people come to you and they say, hey, this happened. And it's a legitimate concern. They say, hey, you know, this happened. It's kind of a red flag to me. I don't know what to do. I'm pretty sure this person is a, you know, twice dead reprobate plucked up by the roots, a raging wave of the, of the sea that we need to throw out of church. It's like, well, 
slow down there, Turbo. Let's pump the brakes a minute and think this through, you know? And, and let me just give you an example, okay? And this is, just, this is just good to cover anyway. Is, you know, this I, you know, sometimes people grow up, especially people that don't have large families, they didn't have siblings or they weren't close, they get older, and, and, and it's, it, God has given all of us, I believe, a natural desire to have children. And we want that, uh, you know, we want that, that, that uh, companionship, I guess, or we just want to, that experience of having children, interacting with them, because that's a really pleasant thing, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's what I love about working at home is you know, I'm in the office for several hours doing my thing, and then I go out to eat, all my kids are at the table. You know, every so often that little door cracks open and, you know, the little sugar plum comes in and says something. I can't understand it, but it's cute. You know, gives me a kiss and then goes back out, you know. And, and it, it's proven you, you, you met, you, you, when you, uh, you know, play with your kids, when you interact and you get endorphins, you know, it, it lightens your mood up. God gives that to people, right? And what I'm getting at is this. When you have somebody who doesn't have that in their life, they don't have their own children, they're not even married, maybe. They didn't have that growing up, maybe they, or maybe they do have nieces and nephews that they're comfortable with and playing with and, you know, picking them up, tickling them, you know. Sometimes people haven't learned that that's probably, that's inappropriate to do with other people's kids. You know, and I believe that. You know, obviously, if, if, if people are saying, yeah, you know, I know here, like, we, we hand my, my, my uh, uh, what's her name? Julie. Look, it's, it's five, okay, so I get to do that, all right? I know I'm not up there with some, some of y'all, but I'm at five now, so I can, and I'm getting older. I can do that now. What's her name? You know? <laughs> at least I didn't go through every name before I got to it. Right, I know we pass the baby around, and that's, that's I'm not, you know, that's fine. It, it's appropriate, but, you know, some people aren't comfortable when you go around and pick up their toddler and tickle them, pat them on the butt, you know, or, or play with them, you know, and ruffle their hair and mess around with them like that. You know, that can make people uncomfortable. And I always advise, like, look, don't do that because it could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> Especially if you're like a single guy, you know, it's, it's, it can, it can seriously, you know, and people do take it the wrong way, you know, and they come to you and they're like, well, what do we, you know, obviously, look, he's playing with the kids. He came over to my kids and, you know, said this and pinched their cheek and swat them on the behind and ruffled their hair. And, you know, it's like, he's obviously a reprobate. <laughs> it's like, well, no, I mean, and I, and I don't want to discourage people from coming and saying that because we do need to know about that. Look, if, if people are getting, because that kind of thing happens, they creep in unawares, beguiling stable souls. You know, it's, they want to get access to children. Church is a soft target to these people. But we can't, what am I getting at? We have to be impartial. We can't just immediately jump to that conclusion. We have to say, well, well maybe this person just wants kids in their life and hasn't been taught that's not really appropriate. You probably shouldn't play with other people's kids. You know, if you get to know them, you know, you're, you're hanging out with them, and there's maybe, I don't know, everyone has to kind of make up their own mind on that, where you draw the line. But the point I'm making is, like, let's not just jump to that conclusion, that this person is some wicked, evil person. Let's be impartial. And the Bible, you know, warns us and tells us over and over again to be impartial in judgment. You know, even, and it might even, what if it was somebody, you know, what if there was somebody, you know, this is going to come a shock, Okay, but what if there was somebody in the church, not this church, but faithful word at large, that maybe I just wasn't the biggest fan of? Say, you're the deacon, you can't not, you have to be. And look, I love everyone in the Lord, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, that doesn't mean I want to spend every waking moment with every single person in the church. You know, there's some people I probably would just rather not have Thanksgiving dinner with. You know what I mean? Ah, can I say that? Is that okay to say that? And you know what? There's probably people who'd rather not have me around. You know, they say, hey, we like, we appreciate you as the deacon. We appreciate you as you're preaching. We appreciate you serving in the church. We understand that. But you know what? We're going to do our own thing on the weekend. Or we're going to, you know what I mean? That's perfectly natural. Not everyone's going to get along. It's unrealistic. But what if somebody came to me and said something about somebody who wasn't, I wasn't the biggest fan of? Am I supposed to just, you know, it would be real tempting. Well, you know what? I've been waiting for a good excuse to throw that person out anyway. And I finally got it. Is that me being impartial? No. That's me being partial. That's me, you know, putting my own two cents into it and, and just making out into something it isn't. It's just so I can get what I want out of the situation. <clears throat> so that's why the Bible warns us about being impartial with people. He said in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, I charge thee before God and Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another before another, doing nothing by partiality. That's a charge 
that Paul gave to Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that he what? Observes these things without preferring one before another with, and doing nothing by partiality, okay? So that's kind of the application there at the end, is that we don't want to be like Joab. We want to be merciful people. We want to be humble people. And how do you, and we have to also beware of the Joabs in our life, okay? And not allow ourselves to be manipulated and be impartial. You know, don't just assume the worst about people. <clears throat> Again, Joab was David's nephew. He could have just said, well, you know, he's not that bad of a guy. You know, he knew who he was. And he, he, I mean, he curses him in the chapter. Did you notice that? He just, you know, let, you know, let, let, let there not be one among his house that doesn't fall on the sword or has an issue or is a leper. I mean, he just curses him for what he did to Abner. Because why? Because he wasn't impartial. You have to judge people not just on what they say, but on their actions. You have to judge people as a whole. You know, you have to judge people, uh, you know, for, for what they do, not just how you perceive them, you know, or what you think that they might be. So that's my message tonight. Let's go ahead and pray.